I'm like, hi, I'm Lucy Walsh. Hi, I'm Lucy Walsh coming to you from California. America. Hello, this is Annabelle Jones. I'm in uh, the middle of the countryside at my, <laughs> at my bell practice. <laughs> Were you in like a bell choir? No, I wasn't in a bell choir. I just... That was worked on their rehearsals every week. (laughs) Anyway, hello! We're together. Together. Together again. Chess. Cheers. We never get to do this anymore because... Oh, I miss you. This is my grandparents' china. If you break it, I'll kill you. I've been dying to tell you this. Remember a couple weeks ago when I told you that I had a seven-year-old who told me that he was triggered by the ocean, Mm -hmm. but he didn't know why? Yeah. Same kid Mm -hmm. told me yesterday that he is addicted to ASMR. He's seven. And I said... (laughs) And he was treating me like I wasn't cool. He was like, do you even know what ASMR is? And I was like, grandma. (laughs) I was like... (laughs) Buddy, I do ASMR on my podcast. And his eyes went all wide and he was like, what? I said, what kind of ASMR do you listen to? <laughs> and he was like, I don't know, like people eating sandwiches. <laughs> I was like, okay. That is some real seven-year-old boy shit. People eating sandwiches. <laughs> also something I'd be interested in listening to. <laughs> I know. Uh, okay. Oh Here we are. Here we are. We are live in person. For the first time since before you went to England, right? Mm -hmm. Nice scarf. Thank you. Let's talk about the scarf. (laughs) So I'm wearing the scarf that we uh, know that I bought from Annabelle last year. Which I tried to give to you. She brought it all the way to England. This scarf has been across the world. Yeah. I I brought that to England with the intention of giving it to you in England. Yep. But you and I never saw each other. Right, and due then, to some... But then also, I kept asking you for your address, and then you gave it to me on Christmas Eve, and I was like, if this bitch thinks I'm going to post this literally in the next week, she's lo- uh, lost her mind. See you in America. <laughs> but you're you, like, here's my address, TTYL. But you work for me, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I'm wearing the scarf, but, but I had another outfit planned, so there's a costume change that's going to be happening <laughs> when I get too hot. And let's talk about your amazing pin bring birches back baby this is um how would you describe this this is it's a gold uterus um these are the ovaries here's the uterus i'm assuming this is sort of like the cervical region yeah this yeah is the cervix here that's where your iud goes you know how i like to talk about my IUD. i know <laughs> i can't wait for the update today it's- <laughs> riveting um so yeah this is the and the ovaries are pearls yeah and then the womb itself has got a diamond in it that's such a fabulous yeah, find where did you get that my friend anita gave it to me she sent it to me i really love it i like it i'm proud of my ovaries and uterus i wonder if they have a male version of that pin i've been looking for a cock necklace for so long mm-hmm. a gold cock necklace <laughs> you think i'm joking and i'm not i'm not like like earrings. A, mm, I don't think I want cocks dangling by my head, <laughs> but I would love to wear balls around my neck. Do we usually use the news first? Yeah, but we can switch it up. No, we no, we need to. People have people a, depend people on have the an expectation of okay how things should be. Did I tell you that one of my friends who listens to the show was like, I don't read the news. The only news that I get is from your podcast. And I was like, that is terrifying. That's dangerous. Yeah. This should not be your only source of news. <laughs> no, like, for instance, that story I told you about that that couple that met on Bumble and then yeah. they found each other in their yearbook. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, there were, like, 20 more like that on Instagram. And I was like, no, it was a scam. Was it? I don't know. But there were all these other ones. Like, oh, these two met on Match.com and realized that their brother and the, sister. Some, some, yeah, all kinds of stuff. And, and they've then, already had three kids. I felt like <laughs> that happened to my friend. Okay, what? I think I've told you this before. My no, friends, okay, my friends' parents are brother and sister. Not only did they have one child, but yes. they had two. Yes, 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 you did tell me. And they disabled the kids. One committed suicide. Oh. 
when he found out she she uh why did i assume it was a boy i don't know i think the uh men well suicide, in england yeah. yeah and then he i wouldn't say he's normal he's a bit off his rocker I mean, aren't we all? But I think if I found out that my mom and dad were brother and sister, I'd be pretty disturbed. Did they know yeah. that they were brother and sister when they got together? Yes. Twice. Okay. They are from North Carolina. Shout out to our listeners in North Carolina. All those siblings listening. <laughs> sister wives. Sister wives. Yeah, into it. Actually, there's something about it I'm kind of into. Like, not the act of the sex so much as just, like, the psychotic idea that you can, like, be in a marriage with, like, ten people and maybe some of them are your family members. Yeah. It's so deranged. It's like France all over again. What? People would get married. They were first cousins. And they'd get married. Darling, in England, in the aristocracy, (laughs) they still do that. They're trying to keep the bloodline going. That's why the royal family had to start... Like, Diana Spencer, Princess Diana, she's actually from American descent. They had to start... Bringing in fresh blood. Because there was, like, disa- there was going disabled on. kids and stuff. Because We never hear about related. those. Why are those just taken away and taken out? Yeah, they put... Did you see, see the crown? Yeah. Yeah, and they had that one sister that's, like, in the home or whatever, and then it turns out there's, like, a bunch of them. Yeah. From different parts of the family. Yeah. Because if you fuck your brother or sister... The chances are it's not going to work out well. No. Two plus two does not equal four in that equation. (laughs) And I'm really bad at maths and even I know that. Um, It's pretty simple. I I forgot to ask my mom actually about my best friend. Oh, your bestie. Let's text her right now. Her imaginary friend, you guys. It's her imaginary friend. I am so convinced that this bitch is imaginary. Mommy, do you remember? It's the middle of the night for her. What are you doing? Leave your mom alone. She just booked an acting job. She did. My mom's going to do a live action um, Jane Austen thing. How cute. Don't take the wind out of her sails with your mystery text about your... My friend I made on holiday. Are you serious? She's not going to know what you're talking about. I think it was in Australia. Somewhere tropical. Or Club Med. <laughs> do you remember Club Med? Did anyone go to Club Med? I never went to Club Med. But do you remember it? The sandals? I remember the story you told me about your dad having sex with one of the staff. That was Sandals. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Big up to Sandals. Um, the events coordinator... No, she was, they were doing a convention. She wasn't an events coordinator, I don't think. I think she was just like a really jacked up employee who loved the Sandals brand. No, anyway. I've never been to Club (laughs) Med. What is that? I think it's like a place that you can go with your family. That is like a vacation place. Yeah, and you go and like the parents, you can go to like day camp and the parents can have a nice time by the pool and drink cocktails or whatever. Right, they're at the topless pool. Yeah. And you're, I don't know, like in a water slide or something. I don't know. Trapped in a water something slide. For families and kids, I don't fucking know. But the point is, I just, I texted my mom. Oh, she texted me back. Which, well, damn. I do, for that but one. I don't remember much about her. Do we have pictures? See, she's fucking real. Does she know her name? Do we have pictures? If we can get a name, we can find her. No, you just put the picture online. You put it on Twitter and you say, Twitter, do your thing. She said, we've got so many pictures. I can't remember if we have pictures, but probably we do. So I'm going to have to go through about 50,000. You're going to have to handle this when you get back to England. I'm going to find my best friend. I hope she's alive. You're going to find your best (laughs) friend? Excuse me? My old BFF from Club Med. You know what? Maybe this has gone far enough. (laughs) You're so scary. Don't frighten me. I don't really believe that this uh, <laughs> investigation <laughs> needs to continue. I think we've reached a dead end. Okay, mommy, don't worry. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Burn all the pictures. Never mind. Mom can remember this random girl from holiday, but not what time I was born. Okay. Yep. Here we are. It's the Lucy and Annabelle show. We <laughs> are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. We have lots of really important things to discuss today. We do. News time! It's not world news! It's not important news! It's Lucy and Annabelle news! Oh my god, the feeling of satisfaction 
compliment being at the same time for me is it's massive. Good. Yeah, it's good. It feels I know. really. You guys don't understand how good that feels. We've now done this from every corner of the world. I want there to be more corners that we do it from. Me too. We're going to do it from many more corners. Okay, coming, I should just like sit up and be like coming here. I know. An adult. Can we like. Hello, I'm coming to you with the news from Lucy while well, she's apart. <laughs> Liz Hurley's peculiar absence wait i didn't do my intro of you oh yeah jesus christ wait shit i didn't come up with a word that begins with c what do you got for us annabelle uh cock tease jones <laughs> that is true actually i am a renowned <laughs> cock tease <laughs> prick tease never fuck ladies that's the rule <laughs> I get so scared. I'll flirt with a man, and then he's like, "Can I have your number?" And I'm like, Aah! "I know, mommy." <laughs> yesterday, yesterday I was coming out of a Starbucks, and I held the door for this man, yeah. just because it awkwardly worked out that yeah. way. And he took it, and he like made very long eye contact with me, and then I ran away, and I went and sat at a table. No. But I was like, "Oh, that was a nice interaction. No. Like, I felt like I did a good deed." And then he came and sat at a table across <gasps> from me, like in my eye line, and no. I freaked out, and I gathered up all my stuff and left. <laughs> no. Mm-mm. That's when I want my mom to come and get me. But first, I put my hand up like this so you could see my wedding ring. You're all. Uh, <laughs> something okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> anyway, Liz Hurley's peculiar absence from Shane Warne's emotional st- state memorial after actress shared her heartache at being unable to attend the service. So Shane Warne is a Australian cricket player, like very well loved in the Commonwealth, and he died of a heart attack or something unexpected along those lines. And she hasn't gone to the funeral she they were they were engaged not at the time of his death but Mm -hmm. in the past and she's since shared pictures of him and them and you know been been on twitter and on instagram lamenting you know the loss and she wrote r.i.p my beloved lionheart and the story is is that she didn't go to the funeral which i think people were like what the fuck but the reason this is my news is because I am a funeral dodger. You are? Really? Yeah. I'm a wedding dodger. I am also a wedding dodger. Yeah. But I'm a massive funeral dodger. I don't need a funeral. Mm. Like, I, in fact, a funeral for me is, is not helpful in my process of, mm. of mourning, grieving, loss. In fact, it feels almost like the opposite of helpful for me. Uh, And I think that's because, I don't know really, I haven't really like dug into it. I'm just, I'm just realizing in the last like a few weeks that I'm a massive funeral dodger. Interesting. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Because it's like quite controversial. Like (laughs) some people think that it's really selfish not to go to funerals. Um, I will always go, like I've been to... A majority of like if my friends parents have died or somebody important to them Mm -hmm. i've been to the funerals but i basically all of my friends that have died um ryan didn't have a funeral i mean his family had a funeral for him but i wasn't able to attend it and i thought that i was going to maybe have another service for him afterwards but now i'm just kind of like i don't think i want to put myself through that quite frankly i just don't like them i don't want them i don't want to be at them but i will go Mm. for a friend or a loved one that like needs me to go there but i don't need the funeral if that makes sense yeah it does make sense so wow that's a really interesting question my mom when we were growing up made us go to every family funeral and funerals in my family were always open casket She always said that that was important because it was a very important part of life was mm-hmm. was seeing death. Mm-hmm. She came from a family where, like I've said before, lot big family yeah. and farmers and the wake would be in the home. Yes. The yes, body yes, would yes, be yes, kept yes. in the home. Yeah. And you saw the body and she didn't want us to grow up with that part of life kind of removed and put over here and hidden. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing as a musician is I get asked to sing 
at, at a lot of funerals. Yeah. A funeral for me, I wouldn't, I, it's not important to me mm-hmm. to have one. Yeah. Do you think it's important for you? If it's important for other people. Right. I yeah, mean, I mean, that's literally like all that, my only connection to a funeral is, is like, do other people need it? Do other people need it? Yeah. Like I didn't go to my grandmother's funeral. I went to her wake, but mm-hmm. I was uh, working on a project in LA and I couldn't stay for the funeral. Mm. And my cousins and my everybody was so mad at me. Mm. They were like, how could you do that to her? I said, I'm not doing anything to her. Yeah. Yeah, she's her and died. I are good. Yeah, and she's we dead. said our goodbyes. Yeah. I don't need to be there for her. She doesn't yeah. know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> because she's dead. <laughs> right. Yeah. She is not here. Yeah. You are here. How could you do that to me? Right. Is really what they're yeah. saying. And I think that there's almost sort of a quite old fashioned, we've talked about this a lot with like the ways that you grieve and like if you think that death, is the end and there's no nothing after that then that's one thing but if you think that death isn't the end yeah then that's another thing and i think i don't know there's just there's i don't think i've re- i rarely have been to a funeral where i'm like yeah that was perfect right i've there's so much artifice there's so much and that's that that yeah. is what i don't like about it we sit here and we pretend these people are holier than thou and we show the highlights real, which of course it's that but let's be honest <laughs> you know and that's what i don't like about it it's that we all have to sit there and go like yes i mean it's like about what we were saying about the artifice around surrounding having children there's artifice surrounding so many things in life, including funerals. You not only see the person built up into this perfect person on a pedestal. Don't that, mention this. Right. And not, I mean. We're not going to remember that bit. They wouldn't want to, they would laugh if they saw you remembering them like that. But the other thing is you see people try to be so important at funerals. Yes, yeah, yeah. And at weddings. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, everybody wants to be clo- the closest one to the person who's mourning. Yes. You felt it with what you've gone through. Or they want to be through. the one that's, like, Or they in want the to be the pain. one that's yeah. in the most pain. I remember in high school, I had a friend named Frankie Toner who was killed in Afghanistan. Not in high school, but right after high school. Mm. He had joined the army and he was over there and he was killed. He was shot. And uh, at his funeral, this girl that we all went to high school with sat in the front row and sobbed. Mm hmm. Like in the family section. Yeah. It's not like a productive thing for me. It really isn't. I'll be there for somebody else if if I if they need me at the funeral or whatever it is, or to be there to support them on that day, of course. But if I don't know people in the life, or I'm not close to people in the life of the person who's died, I ain't going to the funeral. My friend's funeral is, um, I can't remember if I ever told you this, my friend Jamie died while I was in England, the woman who, the commune I lived in. Yeah. It's so weird that we were talking about her. Really? Yep, yeah. yeah, she died. Yep. How? She got a really aggressive form of cancer and she it just like took her weeks whoa just like went and i won't go to her funeral nobody needs me there they all have that they all have each other and their own thing and and i just i got my own thing with her Mm. and my own journey with that and i don't think that she needs me to go there she that's the bottom line is the person does not need you there Mm -hmm. so it's it's your call it's such a personal thing Mm -hmm. as grief is as all these things are now it is a deep human need to come together and remember things absolutely that yeah. is a beautiful thing yeah. to come together remember i just performed at a funeral a couple a month ago that was lovely and they mm. sat around in the sun and they told stories beautiful. for a couple hours and yeah. they laughed and they cried and it was beautiful does the person get anything out of no, that? No, no, it's not for him. It's for you and, and each other. So it's your call. Hands down, 100% for the living. And if we're friends, there is a chance I will not be at your funeral. Just letting you know right now. Okay, I'm fully planned. I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> no. I'm prepared. 
Like, I'll go to your funeral, obviously. Oh, thanks. But only if, like, Will needed me to. Right. Otherwise, I'd be like, okay, bye. Yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> Getting my nails no, done today. No, because I today. feel like it would just be, I, like, need to do it a different way. And then that would cause serious beef because everybody would be like, oh, that She's was her snubbed. podcast partner. Wow. Yeah. <gasps> what happened between them? Yeah. Anyways, no. I just thought it was interesting because it really made me think about, like, how it's, like, a big thing that she didn't go to the funeral. And it's like, maybe she doesn't want to. Yeah. Maybe for her, the grief process doesn't include that. Yeah. Um, but if she went, she would have worn a fabulous dress oh, with a slit up to her puss. What would she have worn? Oh. That's what we want to know. She would have worn a veil and, like, uh, her titties and everything would have been... With this, she wouldn't. She would have been very, like, sophisticated and demure. But in our dream... Yeah, but you know we love her fashion. She would have worn that and then she would have, like, leant over the coffin and her, like, titties would have been like this. And then she would have thrown a rose on there and blew a kiss and said, Love you, Lionel. Love you, Lionel. The new accent you, sounds better. See you on the other side. And then yeah. she just would have just... Sauntered back to her seat. Slinked away and... Sauntered back to her stretch limo. And everyone would have been like... <gasps> clutching their pearls. <laughs> My God. Fuck. Um, anyway, that was my news. What? I My news is sometimes more of a discussion because I just want to ask you a question about something. I love it. That's a very good question. It's a really good question. Okay. Well, my news... Not that you asked, but here it is. Me what my news is. Oh, oh, what's your news, Lucy? Jesus Christ. Okay, so my news, my news brings us back to the United States of America. Uh, yeah. Stop slurping. Your I'm doing fu- ASMR for the freaks. Are you actually doing that on purpose? Do you drink your tea like that? No. Thank God. <laughs> My God. Okay, so <laughs> a man was banned from. All national parks for organizing a 139-person Grand Canyon hike. The limit is only 11 at a time. You can't have more than 11 hikers in a party. And he secretly arranged this 139. Why? Why can't you have more than 11 hikers? Because it's dangerous. (laughs) Why is it dangerous? Surely it's safer because you... you No. Have you been to the Grand Canyon? No. Me neither. <laughs> but I can imagine. It looks too dusty for me. It's super dusty. Super, like, skinny trails. I don't well, know. Don't go. It, you're not 139 people wide. You go single This fire. guy was. Okay. I don't know why I find this story funny. It's just ridiculous that somebody would, like, Unbelievably do that. bureaucratic. <laughs> just... So, he's a Washington State man. He faces probation and a multi-year ban from United States National Parks after he pled guilty to misdemeanor charges because he organized a 139-person group hike in defiance of park guidelines. They had this secret Facebook group, but park rangers finally gained access to it and (laughs) figured out what was going on. They called him, they warned him against hiking the canyon with this oversized group, but he said, nope, still doing it. And they all showed up to do it. He said that his reason for it, he only had good intentions in organizing this event. He intended it to be a respite from the solitude imposed by the pandemic. The fact that he, this man is on probation for organizing people to go to a national park is so fucking... That's a lot of people going down a trail. But who cares if they're all together or if they all just went on their own that day? There should have been, like, no leader, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure. It's a very strange story. I don't really... So when you get there, everyone's like, who's the leader? And you're like, there's no leader. And you're like, no, we just... It's a coincidence. We're not together. Exactly. Yeah. Terrible crime. Yeah. Poorly executed. And now he can never go in a national park again. I just wonder, like, if he wants to be the leader of something so bad that he just, like... (laughs) What's his name? Joseph Don Mount. He's a serial killer. He has three names. Yeah, that's pretty um, pretty serial killer vibes. Joe Don Mount. Joe Don. All right. Well, that was um, strange news. Yeah, I've never done the Grand Canyon. I've just seen so many stories about people falling in. I don't know. I don't think I didn't. I don't think. I'm not going to go close to the edge. No. And I definitely don't want to go down like in. in. 
I'd like to look at it from like a nice hotel in the distance. Yeah. With a cocktail in my hand. Okay, fair. But not like on a donkey. <laughs> like I don't in, think anyone's going on a in donkey the in the Grand Canyon. You're not fucking Mary and Joseph. You can take like a donkey track to the bottom. Do you mean like a mule? Yeah, yeah a I don't think you'll ride donkeys anymore. No, a donkey and a mule is not the same. <laughs> okay, All right. Let's do listen to feedback. That was good. Thanks for sharing that. It was weird, but I liked it. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your weird death <laughs> funeral. Uh, listen your feedback. Okay. One person says, better to regret not having kids than to regret having them. Wow. Somebody else says, sometimes I'm shamed by people and some friends when I say I don't want children. Why'd you make that face? I just can't imagine shaming somebody because they don't want children. It just seems like... It happens all the time. I know, but just fuck off. This person says, hardest job ever, but no greater love than to have a child... And then they leave, as they should. Love, always. Pride in my son's accomplishments. Beyond measure and missing him every day as he leads his own life. Again, as he should. And now what? It's a rip-off. Winky face. (laughs) Go for her, your turn. This listener says, I've never regretted my decision not to have kids. For the longest time, I wasn't responsible enough to take care of a child. I didn't want to have kids with my ex. And now, I'm so used to being alone that I still don't want them. Uh, yeah that was from a man by the way that was from a man yes this listener says child free for the win never had the desire to be a parent thank you both for being so honest about a tough subject i'm really surprised that we got we got so many so comments many messages honest, like yeah. that yeah i wasn't expecting that i was expecting a lot more kickback of like you just don't know you don't understand like what moms say to you like yeah you can't talk about it because you don't know the joy of it until it happens to you or like you'll understand when you're a mom i pray that you experience this soon so that you can change your mind or whatever but we didn't get any of those we got like a lot on the other end of it which i thought was interesting this last one is just like in general about the podcast Mm -hmm. This person says, the two of you are such magical beings. Your podcast has helped me so much. I'm a little behind, but I've been binging it lately, and it just keeps getting better and better. Your laughs turn my day around. Your honesty and your realness is a treasure. Your friendship is beautiful. Thank you for sharing with the world. Your friend and fan from BK. From Burger King. Burger King. Well, I think thanks. it's fan club. Yeah, that's really sweet. That is really nice. Our friendship is so beautiful. Our friendship is a gift to the world. It's beautiful. Okay, so as promised, speaking to you today about media training. And we've been wanting to talk about this for a while because we know that there's lots of people listening who are young artists or in the entertainment industry or want to be and that's right or want to be um and we just thought this would be interesting because we like to give you guys all the information that we got knowledge is power and we don't believe that there should be a paywall for success that's right i feel a bit naughty sharing it do you i don't mean to i feel not- i do feel naughty but also i got fucked upside down the side of the <laughs> music industry so take everything i've learned baby take everything exactly i paid my damn dues for this information and i literally paid for this information it's very valuable <laughs> yeah literally and figuratively it's very valuable literally as we've mentioned like prices in the five and ten thousands of yeah, dollars yeah seriously yeah. so much money but it's also really um, for this valuable, yeah. For this, for this five-page <laughs> packet, guys, it's a thousand dollars a page. Which our labels made us do, yes, and build to us, yes. So yes, we paid for it, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is what you need to keep in mind. Everything that was spent was on you, our tab. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a gift. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> nothing in the music industry is a gift. No, nothing. Remember that. Everything comes with a price tag. <laughs> I was watching as a free lunch. Um, my That's dad used right. to say that a lot. That's funny. <laughs> 
Yeah. So how much, so tell me about your experience with doing press, uh, during your last record label deal. Um, okay. So I guess doing press for me started with blogs and stuff. Cause I'm extremely old. So blogs were relevant at this time. Right. And the way that I kind of got known was by having a song that I made like in my bedroom at the beginning of bedroom pop before that was like a thing mm -hmm. and put it online goes viral all the blogs pick it up and then all of a sudden they all want to talk to you so that was my kind of first foray with speaking to press mm -hmm. bloggers by the way are just like guys in two tight t-shirts that's sitting at starbucks wearing thong sandals like they're not <laughs> real press but they are and for me at that time they are the people that were responsible for getting me signed because they gassed me up so much and printed so much of my shit and shared my music so much that that's what got me noticed by by labels wow okay so it works differently now you just basically have to go viral on tiktok and that's how you get noticed yeah, by yeah. labels now yeah and i got signed um, a different way than you so it's interesting we, we had really different ways yeah, the ways totally. in so that was my first experience and it's very casual. They would send me lists of questions. Usually it would be not over the phone because these people have day jobs. Blogging was a hobby for them for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I would just answer them. So it was much easier because I could edit what I was doing. But right. it was kind of a good lesson because initially I would write stuff down and then I'd be like, go back to it and read it later. Hot tip. Yes. Anything you write, even emails, check double check, step away for a second, read it again. Yes. Trust me, bitch, there's mistakes in there. Yes. There's things you don't want to say. Yes. I had that experience today and I caught myself yeah. and I didn't send that email and I'm so glad I did because it would have caused a huge mess. So always double check, walk away, give it space, come back. Yeah. Yeah. So that was good because it taught me pretty early on before I'd had media training, before I'd been signed to kind of edit myself. Even still, once I got signed, I was described as a machine gun to the face. So, um, yeah, my style of wow. communication. Um, so that's why they put me in media training when I got signed to Atlantic. How about you? What about me? Well, uh, so when I recorded my album and my single went to radio, they sent me on a three-month radio tour where I had to visit three or four radio stations in a day all over the country. Oof. It was a really grueling schedule, but I wanted it. I said, do it. Let's go. Let's go. I want this. I want to make it work. And I'm willing to put the work in. And it was intense. I took an assistant, a friend on the road, which was a lifesaver because I had somebody to hang out with. Mm -hmm. And how it would work is I'd wake up in whatever city I was in at like 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. I'd go to the top radio station. I would do the morning show, plug my single. Uh, I had a radio rep that would meet me in different areas around the country. So labels will usually have radio reps that live around the country and they handle the artist when they come to that part of the world. So whichever radio rep I was with would then drive me from that city to the next city in time for lunch, where we would do radio spots in the middle of the day and take that station to, to lunch, treating them, me, on my, my tab. <laughs> and the radio stations live for this. I mean, they would invite all their friends. It would be like at least five people, five to 10 people from the radio station You'd take them all out. You would wine and dine them. I was the one that had to entertain everybody to make them want to play my single, to make mm -hmm. them want to promote me. So I was on all the time. And then from there, we would drive to a city to arrive in the evening to take that radio station out for dinner. And then if it was four cities in a day, That was because after dinner, we would fly to a fourth city to be able to wake up there at 5 a.m. <laughs> so intense. It was so intense because I had to be social and friendly and outgoing and connecting with these people throughout the day. But then also because I had to eat 
constantly. <laughs> oh my God. I was so sick to my stomach. Like I had such health problems because it was so intense. And my single went to radio and started charting. And I remember the first time I heard it, I was in a cornfield in like Ohio <laughs> and we stopped the car and I got out and we just danced in the cornfield. It was an exciting thing. And I, and, and I, I enjoy that stuff. I, I like, I like doing that kind of work for my project, for, for what I believe in. I will do anything that it takes to promote yeah. the project that I'm working on. But at the end of the day, I would just be, I mean, dead. Like those car rides in between cities, I would just be like conked out because I had to, mm -hmm. I had to re-energize somehow. And so anyway, before I was set off on that, I was given this media training. Radio really could still break an artist back then, which it cannot do now. Uh, radio is kind of the final stop in today's market. Whereas then it was like the first place that you went to break and now and doing a radio campaign costs so much money it costs so much people money people don't really understand i think when you're hearing a song on the radio it has cost hundreds of thousands of yeah. dollars to get that song to the radio yeah. and nowadays a, a artist like lucy walsh or annabelle jones newly signed to a label do not have a hope in hell of their song going to radio because they will not spend the money not unless you have seven million views on on tiktok at least i mean seven million yeah. is a small number <laughs> i mean even then now it's yeah. it's you they just won't chance it unless right. it's kind of you know a guarantee one of the last projects that i witnessed through you know ryan's career where they just did not stop pumping money into it was Lizzo. They just kept pumping money into it. And we just couldn't believe it because they just don't really do that very much. No, they don't. And she had, she had like a bit going on, but she wasn't, you know, there was no like TikTok at, when she was coming through. Right. And they could just see that something was reacting. And so they just took the chance. Right. And it was a great great risk that they took but it's yeah. even if you go viral on tiktok now it's not not in the slightest is it is it a given that a label will one give a fuck about you and two if you're signed to them take you to radio that's right what yeah. it was when i got signed was college radio so the only option for independent artists was to go and do what you did but at college radio mm -hmm. um and that was a great way to find fans and make fans and get your song out there yeah i don't know if any of you guys know the band take that and some of like backstreet boys and nsync did it where they would go around and they would tour high schools yeah so that's another way that you can get your music out there is basically like touring school campuses and i and that's still huge. is a thing that you can do that it's still huge, has yeah. an impact so um, something worth considering when you are planning your tour if you're an artist who's just starting out is find those college campuses yeah I remember um, one of my things that they had me do was I went to Disney World and I performed at the national cheerleading championships for all wow. the high schools all around the country and my song was like the the official cheerleading championship song of the summer and um groups from every school competed by choreographing a dance to my song and then the winner got to perform with me at Disney World and that market is huge not everybody's going to get that chance to do what I did but you're right you can plan a college tour plan a high school tour because those become diehard fans I mean that's that's well the now age. you would have to pay for what happened for what your label arranged for you that marketing because that is a, that is a marketing technique and a plan that they've put in place I was like okay great I know what we're gonna do somebody in a boardroom came up with that we're gonna take Lucy's song we're gonna take it to this you know blah blah blah, blah. we're gonna take it to the championship it's gonna get played hundreds of times to hundreds of people we'll make it into a competition now you'd have to pay 
And you'd be lucky I know. if at a cheerleading competition they used your song. I know. Because then it would go on YouTube and it would get views. There would be no, like, it, no one would give a fuck. You'd be like, oh, you get to perform with the singer at Disneyland. Who fucking cares? <laughs> like, it's just changed right. so much now. You it's know what crazy. else they did with my single was they put my face on the milk cartons that were going to every high school in the country. I mean, oh, just... It's crazy. Like, stuff like that's just not built in to labels. No, because they the don't moment. want to spend the money on it. Do you know how much money they spent on promoting you? Yeah, I was signed up front for uh, $400,000, appro- mm-hmm. like, around there. And by the end of it, they had spent nearly $2.5 million. <laughs> So, was the 400000 for your advance? So, your advance is, your per- is the personal money that they give to you because they say we're going to sign you for five albums and what we're going to give you in exchange for that is $400,000. Right. So they gave me the 400000 100000 of that was for me personally to live on. And the other 350000 were to make the record. Um, okay. And then they just kept throwing money at it, kept throwing money at it, blah, blah, blah. And it got to be nearly two and a half million, I believe. I mean, for instance, my music video cost $125,000. And it never came out. (laughs) Um, I was working with producers like Tricky and Dream, who at the same time were doing Rihanna. I was signed with Rihanna. I've mentioned this before, but her and I were recording songs back and forth, like the same demos. It's crazy. And um, I went into the studio like the day after she had done Umbrella with these guys, but it hadn't come out yet. And I heard it like very bare bones demo, which I actually preferred that version way better. <laughs> but you got demoitis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always have demoitis. But because of, you know, they were the hot name at the time, uh, the labels were paying producers like the producers were the star, not the artist. So every producer I worked with charged around thirty to forty thousand dollars per track. I mean that's not changed. I know that hasn't for a big changed. Producer that hasn't all. changed. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Um, then what they did, which was the worst idea, was they had these guys rapping on my music, <laughs> which Jesus was never Christ. gonna work. I don't know if you've heard my music online, but it's not really uh, rapper conducive. conducive. No. <laughs> yeah. What are your numbers? Do you care to share? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was signed for an undisclosed amount. Okay. Because I was, <laughs> I was signed via a production deal. Right. So was I. I was never told how much I got signed for. Okay. So what? Yeah, yeah. So Where I. Where were got, your lawyers? My lawyers told me not to sign the fucking deal. They told you not to sign it. <laughs> and amazingly, my lawyer has stood by my side this whole time. Bless him, Joe Britton at Russell's. He has been by my side. He was like, don't fucking sign this. Wow. But I think he felt like he just like had to see me through. I know, bless him. He's put, he's unpicked me from knots that he has begged me not to tie more than I care to. I mean, most um, artists should never sign sure. any of these deals. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> So my production deal, I signed for whatever amount was. I literally cannot even remember now. But I think I got like 30 from that. Yeah. And then 70 from the late, from Atlantic. Yeah. Because the people I was signed to the, the guys I was signed to the production deal with, they were like, no, 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 no. You don't get the 100 from the label. You just get the 70 and then we take the 30. That's what happened to me that you've already spent. Right. And then on top of that, they got paid more money. Right. So it's my understanding that my deal was around 350000 Right. And they took the lion's share of that Jesus. between them. So uh, it, from what I know and what I've learned, they each took 100000 and I took a 100000 100, Wow. Now, at the same time as I got signed, my manager sued me because I left him to go to a bigger management company, and he won. So that was another $30,000. After taxes, wow. ladies and gentlemen, you're lucky if you can treat yourself to a fucking foot bath. <laughs> no, that's the thing that's crazy about being signed as okay. You're like, whoa, $100,000, that's crazy. Okay, taxes. Now what are we at? Now you're at fifty. 
<laughs> okay, we got fifty thousand dollars, and we have to live off of fifty thousand dollars for how many years? And then you've got your production deal, like we both had, or your agents, or your managers, people, and your lawyers taking a percentage as well. That's five ten percent. They're ten percent. It's 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 tricky to make a living as an artist. It really is. And nobody is paying for your clothes, and nobody no. is paying. You know, for me, like I went into debt when I was signed to my production deal, specifically because. I couldn't keep up with with going back and forth from LA to England. And despite the fact that they would pay for my flights and accommodation, that's all they paid for. So I'm there in the studio for three months and there's no car, there's no Uber to and from the studio. Mm -hmm. So I began walking. There's no food. There's no, do you know what I mean? It's not like you're being provided for. So your $50,000 that you're meant to live on for one to five years right. is gone. It's like less than minimum wage. <laughs> in the first... Yeah, no, it is. And that's the thing. Record deals are... If you looked at them like a loan, which is what they are, and you put them through the same system and the same rigorous checks and balances that a loan from a bank would have to go through, it's illegal it would be illegal to give somebody a loan on those terms. So I always say to artists, you know, when I do my, when Ryan and I were working with the artists doing promotion and digital marketing and development, which I continued to do for a while after he died, and they're obsessed with getting these label deals. I'm like, how's your credit? Yeah. Before you go and do that, look at getting yourself a bank loan, a small bank loan budget think about the money you're going to spend or save up like you are signing your life away for less than minimum wage for a minimum of five albums which you will never get to make no you're you will be lucky if you even make your first album what they say to you is you're going to make an album a year you're not no you're not you're not even going to make five albums in maybe eight or nine years maybe This is why it takes artists so long who are established to work through their deals. Yeah. It takes probably 18 months to two years to make an album. And then you've got to make all the videos and you've got to promote it and then you've got to tour it. Guess what? It's already been two years. It's been three years now. (laughs) And it never gets easier. It's not like you hit a level and then all this goes away. Look at the nightmare Taylor Swift has been going through with just bad deals that were signed in the beginning even somebody like her you just assume that that person's making millions and no they're not it's tough and 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 we really feel strongly about talking about this and teaching others informing other people just like we were talking about childbirth like let's talk about the truth of it so that we can help people make informed decisions Yeah. Because what we've been through is very, very valuable. It's pretty rare. There's not many people I know who have had the deals that we've had. And that's just one of them. I mean, you and I have had long careers. I've had multiple record deals. I've I've had acting is different. But still, I mean, you're signing deals. You have all these representatives on your team that you have to pay every time you book something. And one thing exists in all of it which is doing press Mm -hmm. and that's what we really wanted to talk about today so so let's just read through our packets and kind of share what what popped out at us i went through and underlined a bunch of stuff so i'm just going to start at the beginning of this why are you here obviously you're here because you want to learn to do good interviews manage your um reputation promote your product promote yourself and then the next thing it says is the truth about interviews and I really like this being interviewed is not a passive process where you show up and answer whatever you're asked it's a fully active process in which you are not only in control of your message but you're collaborating with the producer editor or reporter to create a story or entertaining piece of footage that works for the media the better your quotes and sound bites are the more likely your piece is to be run so it's a performance. You're not there just going, yeah, I wrote it like this, I did this, I did that. Like, make it interesting for yeah. them. 
Otherwise, you're just going to be like one of ten other bitches they spoke to today, and the girl who says, or the guy that says the most interesting thing is going to get that shit pushed to the front. That's right. It's true. Mine has this five commandments of interviews, and that's one of the points. It says, thou shall be quote worthy. And it says, most reporters would rather use your words than paraphrase them. So help them by making your words usable. Make them entertaining, colorful, concise. You are in control. This is your interview. Mm. I like this here. It says, I mean, there's a, there's a bit here which I don't agree with. The power is in your hands. You can do the absolute best that you can and you should always. But ultimately, you have got to know that they are going to paint you yep. however they want to. Yep. So my best advice is like, don't give them any ammo. It says over and over in here, you are dealing with a reporter, not a friend. They mm-hmm. are a microphone, whether they have a pencil and paper in their hand or not, whether they're recording or not, they will take everything you say. So don't be too comfortable. A note that I took care is remember that you're the most exciting thing that's happening in their day. They may have, and you may have spoken to eight people about the same thing, but change it up each time because you don't want the same thing to go out again and again and again and again. Right. So add a little spice, a little different anecdote, whatever it is. Um, and it says here, what successful artists know is how to make the press work to their advantage. I mean, I'm not, yes and no. The thing that I think is interesting about that is I, where I agree with that is like, you know how we see celebs get out cars and you see like, oh my God, like her pussy was showing or like she's showing up at this Italian restaurant in Beverly Hills that everyone wants to go to or she's going to this or she's at Nobu. Yes, people tip the press off, whether it's waiters and waitresses or the door guy or the stewardess at the fucking thing, or it's the artists and publicists themselves. They will frequently have arrangements with the paparazzi yeah, and relationships with them. And this is one way that I agree you can control to a degree the press is that some of the most famous and kind of refined in the sense that they do kind of control what goes out into the tabloids i'll give you an example um i believe gwen stefani and then one other person i saw at this one specific restaurant in hollywood greets the paparazzi gives them their shot gets in and out of the car a couple of times walks to the door walks back waves smiles literally does like a mini two minute photo shoot for them and then they leave her alone for the rest of the night i love that i think that's so smart very smart that's all they want exactly so she knows she can be left alone for the rest of the night if she stops and gives them their little picture and you're helping them because they get to go home to their family and they don't have to stand there all night they got the shot they can sell So then the next time you see them, they're going to be kinder to you because they know that you help them out. Should it be this? No. Is it? Yeah. uh, Is it negotiating with terrorists? Absolutely. fucking Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's, That's really interesting. I like this. It says, always remember that you are not talking to the reporter. You're talking through them to their audience. So you are using the reporter to get through to the public. Yeah. Yeah. Things to know before every interview. Know the type of media outlet that you're talking to. Is it The Hollywood Reporter? Is it Billboard? Is it People? So you know the type of audience that you're speaking to. Therefore, you can cater your responses and your interview to that audience. Know how much time the reporter has to you has with you so you can make sure that you get in everything that you want to get in this is really useful no matter what you're doing if you're in a job interview if you're speaking to somebody that you want something from if you have to ask a favor this is all really relevant stuff it's not just about being in interviews there's pages and pages on what you should do at radio what you should do at tv what you should do like what kind of personalities they like right yeah it's basically manners like have manners be engaging be fun, be quippy, be clear. This is the one thing that always stuck in my head from media training is 
you are there to sell. And as an artist, you go into the world and you're, oh, yes, I'm here because I've written this song and it means so much to me. And I'm going, <laughs> and somebody wants to talk to me about it. It's so lovely. No. Sorry. No. That's cute. It's a nice story. Your song is like a product that you would pick up off the shelf at a shop. Yep. And lots of artists don't like this. They don't want to think about it this way. They don't want to even acknowledge that that's the case. You are selling a product. So when I say your product, I mean your song, your album, your EP, whatever it is. Always bring it back to your product. Yep. Always find a way to bring the conversation back around to your product so you can promote it. But also, it's a really good way to like dodge out of shit that you don't want to talk about or you know stuff that bores you or you're not interested in talking about it's true and there's literally there's literally four directions right here about how to do that when there's something that doesn't serve your agenda for selling your product one is acknowledge the question with a short very short answer two is build a bridge by saying however or on the other hand Mm -hmm. and then you deliver your agenda point you drive it home with a noteworthy line about your product, naming it. Don't just call it my song, my Mm -hmm. CD. You call it whatever the song is called or whatever your Mm -hmm. book is called, whatever your movie's called, whatever you're pitching. And then you shut up and you don't refer back to the original question that didn't serve your agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got that here, Bridging. Yeah. Um, Be aware. Okay, so... A journalist is a journalist. Never, ever. I don't care if you think you're friends. I don't care if you think you're having lunch together. I don't care if you are fucking. I don't care shit. Never, ever say anything around a journalist that you do not want to be aired or printed. It's true. I have some friends who are journalists and it's a really tricky one. (laughs) And this made me laugh. It says, before you do the interview, check the news. Check the latest news about you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You do not want to learn about a new development about yourself from the reporter. (laughs) Yeah. Which has happened to me when I found out that my dad was engaged when I was on the red carpet. I think I've shared that before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he had gotten engaged. I didn't know about it. I was live on camera, and this woman from CNN asked me about it. I was so thrown for a loop um, that she ended up sending me flowers the next day because she felt so badly. But, yeah, we don't want to be... (laughs) Fucking hell. So is that footage anywhere? I'm sure it is. I should try to find it. Oh, my God. We should try and find (laughs) that. Fuck me. I want to see that so bad. I'm so sorry to say that to you, but I do. I know that was traumatizing for you. But I just want to see how you handled it. Yeah, it was wild. And then when I got married and my dad wasn't there and he came at me with something to say about it, I was like, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really? Really? (laughs) There's some really good ones on here that I really like. Know that you don't have to answer every question. Yes. It's really hard in life in general to say no, or I don't want to talk about that. But it is hard, isn't it? I try to say that all the time on here. When I see (laughs) when I see people who I'm just like, this person has been media trained to death and within an inch of their life, and like the person and the soul has left the body. We are just dealing with like somebody who has memorized their pamphlet. Yeah. That is something I will say, like, don't be that person. There's a middle ground where you get to be yourself and talk about your product and get along with these people without just being, like, an automaton. And it it just seems, like, really outdated to be, like, on just repeating the same message again and again and again. Right. Um, Answer things quickly, politely, and in, like, a non-confrontational way. Because, obviously, if you get heated, they're going to know and they're going to start digging more. But I would say, in general, when you wave the white flag to a reporter and you cont- and you hold up and you continue to wave it, they will desist. Because they will look bad if they don't. And then other people will not want to interview with them. 
right. if they see that you have been pushed past your boundaries and you've tried to say no I I you know I and you say it in a nice way you know it's a great question but I'd really rather not talk about that today or that's painful for me or it's hard for me to talk about that and I hope you'll respect that politely wave the white flag I would say nine out of ten times maybe not at first exactly but they will desist yeah and you have that right in life no matter what with anyone you're talking to always this is on that topic this says if you don't have an answer do not make one up that answer may haunt you forever yes and it also says that um if you're getting some hostility in an interview there are different tricks that journalists will use on you to try to get you to get scrambled um it says a pause is a trick if they mm-hmm. pause and they're just oh, yeah. waiting for you to answer, that's a trick. Because humans don't like sitting in that silence. No. Don't be afraid of silence. That's one of the things that I don't need to read here that I remember being told. It's like, they will sit in silence. And sh- she said to me, like, I don't care if you sit there for three minutes. Yep. Don't break. No. Because then you'll start going, <gasps> Yeah, you'll start trying to fill that awkward silence. And yeah. if you watch interviews, if you watch stuff in the press, you'll see journalists use this trick a lot. All the time. When you are finish answering a question, stop talking. Stop talking. I like to use the silence trick. And since I learned it in that classroom that day, I use it all the time now. I use a silence trick on people all the time. I just, I just stop talking. Especially if I'm trying to negotiate a price or I'm, you know, dealing with something or, you know, whatever it is, if I'm dealing with a spicy situation or somebody is trying to strong arm me, I like to let them know I'm not, I will sit here with you for three and a half minutes in silence. I love that. (laughs) You just see people like crumble in front of you. And as an artist, you're already nervous. You're there. You're trying to promote your thing. You're am I doing the right thing? I'm new to this. I don't know. So they know that that's going to get you all, <gasps> this yeah. is awkward. What's happening? I'm not performing. Like I right. should be saying something. I remember I was doing an, a phone interview with Rolling Stone magazine one time and my publicist was on the call. And I remember in the middle of the call, she was like, Lucy, can I speak to you privately for a minute? And she like went on our own line. She called me on the other line and she was like, stop talking. You are saying way too much. Your answers are so long-winded. You need to like just fucking yeah, cut say it less. out. Yeah. Right. Don't ramble. I yeah. didn't know that yet. I thought like, oh, this person wants to hear my life story. And yeah. oh, this person, you know, gives a fuck. No, this is a fucking interview. They don't give a fuck. They're just hoping you're going to say some shit that they can print as like a quippy soundbite to get people to click on their shit. So thank God my publicist was on that call because if I was unchaperoned, it would have been like, you would have known, you know, some devastating things about my family. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. What else do we got? Have you ever had a time where you regretted saying something in the media? Like every time I talk to them, I just reg- <laughs> like I just hate everything. I just I don't like lo- I don't love doing interviews in the same way. I don't love bios. I just listen back to myself and I'm just like, oh, bitch. Yeah, it's definitely not for everybody. This is a- how about you? Well, yeah, I mean I've shared a couple of them today, um, but this is interesting to talk about from different facets because like back during Christmas when as a joke I shared that article in the in the sun news you mm-hmm. know in England that Will and I had gone home to surprise his family for Christmas mm-hmm. and you were like wow it sounds like you guys gave quotes and stuff and we hadn't so what it says in your packet about like that you can control how the media sees you is not true at all all you can control are the words that come out of your mouth but even that gets messed with yep like ben affleck is all upset because his words have been taken out of context (laughs) apparently about his wife and you know and i've seen the media do awful awful things like when i was close with britney and they were 
like almost getting in car accidents with us to chase us yeah. around. That's the other end of the spectrum. I like what you're talking about with the Gwen Stefani where she's like working with them and they're coming to terms of some sort. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What were the other things that were like the tricks that they use? So that you don't fall for any tricks. This talks about grounding yourself physically. It On this page, it shows us T.I. He's leaned way back in a chair and it says, this is how not to sit in an interview. And then above him, it shows this like old fashioned man with his ankles crossed and his hands in his lap. And he's sitting stick straight. And it says, this is how you want to sit. It says, don't cover your private parts. And there's a picture of Bill Clinton down here with his hands over his dick in an interview. It says, oh that God. looks like you're hiding something. It <laughs> says, it says if, if you're standing, don't lock your knees because locking your knees can cause you to pass out. <laughs> My God, what? It says, don't move around, don't fidget, don't like shift, don't look back and forth. That makes you look shifty and untrustworthy. You want to maintain direct eye contact. You want to move very little. Don't touch your hair. Don't touch your face. This is why I hated doing breasts, because this is all I'm doing all the time. I'm just like, (laughs) (laughs) that's what we do when we get nervous. And I have this rule with myself. Like I had a Zoom meeting this morning with people in England about a movie role and I was on with the producer and the writer and my my rule with myself when I get on a call or if I go into a room is I I get my hair the way I want it I get my clothes and everything and then I am I am not allowed to touch my hair once because not only do I hate it when I see people touching their hair in a in a meeting or an interview but it doesn't express confidence it shows that you're fidgety you're still unsure of yourself you're you're not pulled together in the way that you need to be to sell something to close that deal and that's what this is about you are making a sale you're closing a deal and people respond to confidence and ease ease Mm. i got this i got this i'm here you're here we're talking let's do this yeah that's what people respond to i'm understanding More and more why they thought I needed media training. (laughs) I'm like going round and round on the swivelly chair, just like, do you guys want to go get coffee? It's boring in here. Like that was me. When I was signed in my early 20s, that was me the whole time. Like, oh, it's like boring in here. You guys want to go get a drink? (laughs) Like, should we do this at the restaurant? I'm hungry. Did you guys eat lunch? (laughs) That is funny. It talks about... Well, it talks about the importance of grabbers, and that's why what they said about you made me laugh. What did they call you again? A machine gun to the face? Yeah. Because that's a grabber. That is hilarious. Um, It says create word pictures for them. Like saying something like, the audience was a collection of flatliners until I took the stage and sang Crash. That was my song at the time. Yeah. Then they really came to life. It drives home your positive point. And paint pictures for them. Make yourself quotable. Yeah, exactly. And spend some time on that. Even if it's just in your personal life, just come up with some funny quotes that you... I mean, we, these run through our brain all day long and then we don't use them. But we should. Give them some spice. Exactly. And you are a genius at that, Annabelle. So I don't think it's genius. I think it's just natural mental deficiency well then you're a natural genius but i can't wait to watch you the next time you're doing press for a project and just see how you just put all that to use i'm posing for everyone that's just listening i'm just really getting my angles oh that hurt my back i think you should call your next album machine gun to the face you're gonna love this one You'd be, you would loathe this, and I can't wait for you to have to do it next time. It says the media loves ST words like first, last, best, biggest, smallest. They love quotations, so you should quote your own lyrics for maximum effect. (laughs) I love that. I just just start speaking in riddles, and it's just lyrics from your song. Exactly. Also, a great way to get it back to the product. It says use metaphors like. That festival is the Super Bowl of rock music. Um, It says, use similes. Recording with my producer is like going to heaven without having to die. 
Use comparisons. Performing in a studio is hard work, while performing in front of a live audience is pure spontaneous fun. And tell little stories. See, that's all good. That's what I do naturally. So that stuff, I'm can't wait to do press with you for our TV show. <gasps> Hot take. Good thing we've um, got our packet. I know. I'll be reading this. My dad used to do interviews, and I remember sitting there listening to him and just being like, "This cannot be how you do it." <laughs> but I remember just so many times just being like, "I don't think that's how it's meant to be done." This is really going on a long time, and you pacing and saying things that nobody wants to hear. I don't pacing. I don't think my dad had media training. I think no, I don't think it. that was a thing. My dad sways a lot. Your dad paces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, questions that are better not to answer. I like this. I think this is really handy. Okay. So questions you don't know the answer to. You could be wrong. So just just say, I don't know, actually. Questions you don't understand. Questions that basically need clarification. You could ask for clarification or you could, I guess... Yeah, ask for clarification and then right. decide whether to respond or whether it falls into the previous category of questions you don't know the answer to. Right. Um, questions that are better suited to other people if they are asking you about, you know, deficient funds in the music industry or this, that and the other instead of giving your opinion on it. Because first of all, it's fucking boring. Um, second right. of all, like, just be like, do you know what? It'd probably be better if you spoke to somebody at the labor about that. I'm not really sure. Or, you know, with things like the war going on, probably better if you ask a politician, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. About like, that. what's your take on Zelensky at the Grammys? Um, you know, I'm gonna have to pass you on to a professional on that. <laughs> not sure... Not sure anyone on my team has a degree in politics, so I'll just see right. myself out of that one. Something that goes along with what you're saying, which I have here, is do not cop an attitude. If you don't have an answer, yeah. don't cop an attitude. You want the reporter's audience to like you. They're more likely to if the reporter likes you first. There is nothing the media likes better than knocking someone off of their high horse. If you never get up in that high saddle, then they will never have the chance to do it to you. Love it. This page is good. The truth about journalists. Ooh. Journalists are not out to get you. They're out to get a story. I'm not going to read the rest of it. Just use your brain. Right, right. And they will let you twist in the wind and ramble. Yeah. Hoping you're going to say something that they can use. A journalist's job, this is very important, is not to promote you. Right. That is not their job. It's your job to promote you. It's their job to sell newspapers. Aha. Or whatever the fuck they're selling. Big difference. And journalists don't generally go into an interview with an agenda. So present yourself the way you want to be seen and talk about what the fuck you want to talk about. It's your life, baby. About what I was saying with the Rolling Stone interview that was way too long. This mm -hmm. says, keep it short and simple. Follow the 30-10-3 rule. Make your answers no more than 30 words and take no more than 10 seconds to answer and have no more than three sentences. Okay, that's counting in numbers, so I'm out. That's about counting. But this count. is what they're saying. Practice it. Practice. Come up with things and boil them down. I do this all the time on our podcast because I can ramble. And I'm practicing this with just shortening answers like self-editing self-editing like building in self-editing that i think is good and agree with um and i have learned the hard way i think through interviews and also the podcast has been an absolute fast track to that for me it really has very quickly i was like i swear too much i say um too much i say like too much i get like giddy and silly and like don't say the things that I want to say or get to the point. I get a ramble. I get confused. So that's been really good because it's trained me slightly. To, I mean, listen, I know that I'm a complete spasmoid like most of the time, but no, you're it's right. Helped, it's helped a bit. 
I the feel podcast, like we, yeah. I mean, when I rarely, rarely, rarely ever edit any of my shit out. And I feel like at the beginning, I used to have to like edit loads of stuff out all the time. because so I'd be like, fuck, I can't really say that. Or I shouldn't have said that. Or I didn't say that very well. Yeah, it's been a crash course. It really has. Have you found that? Are you, do you find that you just like take way less stuff out now that it's pretty, you know, other than the long silences or when I'm like munching or burping? Right, I do. What I've found is that it makes me way more aware in the moment when I'm answering something because I know that if I don't, I'm going to have to take the time later to fix it. (laughs) And so So for you, it's like a a scheduling issue. You're like, no, I do not have time. I don't have time. I don't have time to go into it. (laughs) But no, it's, it's been so valuable for me to practice these things with how we run our show. This is something I thought was really great, which is in an interview, begin with your conclusion and then bring in your supporting data. It says in everyday life, we normally build up to our conclusion when we're talking, but Mm -hmm. when we're talking to the media, you want to start with your conclusion. And I think that's a great way to be in life too. I want to practice that. that. I like that. I want to be like, like, if you ask me a question, I want to be like, well, Here's my answer, blah, blah, blah. And I'll tell you why. Like that's yeah, a totally. way more engaging way instead of rambling and the person's like, Jesus Christ, when are they ever going to tell me how they really feel? Yeah, I love that. I love I that do so too. much. It says, you've heard of cooling down after a workout. How about cooling up prior to an interview? Here's how it works. You meet the reporter, you make some small talk. It's a good idea to introduce yourself to the crew and to anybody else who's with the reporter. Yeah, this helps that. you humanize yourself with the reporter and it helps you to humanize them and their crew. Once you've yeah. cooled up, then you're ready for the interview because you'll be thinking of the reporter as a human being and they will be thinking of you as the same way. So yeah. that's really valuable in life, no matter what you're doing. You want to get on a human level where you can find some common ground and be vulnerable with that person before you get into... Any business stuff like that. Like in, It's kind of, you know, not to sound slimy, but you're ingratiating yourself and you are, like they said, humanizing yourself. Yeah. What I think is interesting about that is that instead of just, <laughs> they said cooling up instead of just warming up. Cooling up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's been on my mind a lot recently because in an acting class I was in, there was a lot of time spent on learning how to sell yourself. Yeah. And it kind of wiped out all of my instincts and all of yes. my isms, all of me, uh, all of my, yeah. all of Lucy. And so yeah. I was going into rooms and I, I wasn't bringing anything to the table because I was a robot. I was just yeah. trying to, like you're saying, sometimes you hear people and you're like, Jesus Christ, you've memorized your packet. We get it. But where like, is the person? Where's the person? And so now that I've let go of that and I'm, and I am showing up with myself Mm -hmm. it's such a different miraculous experience yes queen because that's what it's about it's about people it's about i said this in a post a couple weeks ago where i mentioned i'd had a meeting with one of the top television companies and i said after the hundreds of hours of work it's just about holding space with good people Mm mm-hmm And everything we do in our business life, no matter what you do, it's all about that. It's about people helping people that they like. And I had a dream and I woke up from the dream and this quote came to me and I wrote it down in time before I forgot it. Let me find it right here. It says, in order to exchange currency, one must have relationships. Mm. It was so strange. I woke up out of a sleep and I I talk about spirit giving me inspiration and and lines like that. And it was just as if somebody had said it in my ear. In order Mm. to exchange currency, one must have relationships. Mm. And this is what this is what that meant to me is the more you humanize yourself and see the other person as human, the more of a connection you're going to make the farther out into the pond that ripple's going to go. And only then can true currency flow back and forth. Everything Mm. else will come. As long Mm. as you're functioning as a human and seeing other people as human, everything else will come. Mm. You can't Mm. chase the dollar. You can't chase fame. 
That shit's not real. You got to start with what you've got. And what you've got is you in this moment as you are. Yeah. And you don't have to fix yourself or change yourself or do anything differently. You, as you are in this moment, are enough. And we need to trust that. Yeah. And if it's not enough, then it's not the right vibe with that person. That's not the deal for you. That's not the person for you. Exactly. And it's it's not going to work out if you try and bend yourself into a pretzel trying to be the thing that they want. What you just said really reminded me of something that I may have talked about before. I can't remember. It might have been on an episode that we never had to come out. But um, when I first came over after being signed to the to Atlantic, there was so much focus on like the product. And all of a sudden I went from being an artist to being a product. And yeah. in three months I got completely, and this wasn't by Atlantic, I have to say, this absolutely, like my, I cannot state enough, like my relationships with the people at Atlantic were great and Atlantic were great. All of my shit, for the most part, comes from my production deal with those two men. Mm -hmm. Over the course of three months, I was so turned around and kind of brain wa brainwashed. I'm not sure the best word to use, but I caught myself talking to a friend and an old friend, and he was like, "Why are you talking about yourself like in this way? You're like always." trying to explain yourself or hmm. why you're like a certain way. And I just remember feeling so embarrassed and so mortified and just like a total fucking narcissist, basically. And it's because I'd spent three months trying to figure out what kind of product I was going to be. Yeah. What did my clothes say about me? What did my smile say about me? What did my hair color, my what I ordered for lunch, what I... because during that process of being signed to that production deal, every single fucking fiber of my being was taken apart and fucking criticized and told it was wrong and needed to be changed. So I began trying to reinvent who this product version, this pop star fucking whatever it was version of Annabelle Jones was. And... I didn't even know how to just be Annabelle anymore. All I knew how to do was like explain every thing. Well, oh, the reason I'm wearing this designer is because I love, blah, blah, blah. you know, like it just all became uh, an advertisement. It was like yeah. I was some like walking advertisement for myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to take a minute to respond to him. And I remember stopping in the street. I was in, when it's when I was living in Notting Hill. And I just turned off Portobello Road and I just like stopped for a second. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God, this is terrible. And this is not, I can't live like this. It can be very paralyzing, can't it? Nobody is meant to look at themselves that much. Right. Nobody is meant to sort of like think about themselves and analyze themselves and pick apart every single, what does this say about me? What does me buying gold fucking things say about me? And, you know, are these vitamins that I take and my, you know, the, the type of bone that I have and everything. It's like, what kind of books I read? It's like, no, just like, be, be the person that you are. But I think this process can really, 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 whether you're doing media training, whether you're signed or not, as soon as you are an artist and you have to start thinking about yourself as a product, it's very, 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 very disturbing to your piece. To be an artist, you have to be in flow. You have to just be almost not really in that place in your head. And I think that's one of the contradictions of being signed and uh, where artistry and commercial interests meet. It's almost like, how do you keep yourself safe and your art safe and pure and good, joyful, peaceful in the face of this? But machine? handle yourself as a business. Yeah. Yeah. I can absolutely relate to everything you're saying. It's very tricky, but you must mm. function as both. 
you must understand that this is show business. Yeah. And there's a lot of money at stake. And that can be very overwhelming. It was very overwhelming for me in that particular record deal. And now I feel that I'm finally understanding it, the dichotomy of it, and being comfortable. Playing with both knowing, parts. Yeah, playing both parts with knowing that I have to step into this now and I have to handle this. And then I can go back over here and, mm. and enjoy myself again. No one else is going to do it for you. Mm. No one's going to handle your business for you but you. When I lost my manager, when I was signed, I we parted ways. Um, I found it really hard to be in the studio and then also be like having emails and text messages and stepping out for phone calls and stuff. And it completely, completely like crippled my creativity and I couldn't do both. So I had to very much structure my week so that... Monday, Tuesday is admin, I'm at home, I'm at my computer, I'm doing this. And then the second half of the week is creativity. Obviously, you have to deal with things as they come in. Right. But have having very specific admin days was really helpful for me. And then also um, being so disciplined and so boundary that when I sit down in my creative space to my creative time, I do not answer the phone. I do not. It can wait. Whatever yes. it is, it can wait a few hours for you to do the thing that you are here to do. Right. Don't, I'm not going to say don't forget because I don't like that. It's like, remember why you're here. Go from that place. And I think that that ties into everything that's in our pamphlet. It does. Remember why you're here, whether that's in the room promoting yourself, whether that's showing up to your job at the store whether that's in on planet Earth, as a member of your family, whatever it is. Like, I think the purest kind of intent, the, the purity can come from there. The truth yeah. can come from there. It, am I being too woo-woo about this? Not at all. Everything else will come from there, from that, yeah. from that grounded center. And that's yeah. a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. I'll be I'll be somebody different in five years yes. and a year from now than I yes. am now. And, and and why you're here may be different in five sure. years from now. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Because our purposes change throughout our life. You're not here for one purpose. But looking back, I just wasn't equipped to know who I was yet. And I got I got swept up in a tsunami mm. that was far too powerful for me to handle. Mm. And I have taken a lot of blame. For that, I have blamed myself entirely, and I'm learning now to let myself off the hook. And like you're saying, my label was awesome. They were, again, just trying to sell a product. Just like the yeah. journalist is trying to sell newspapers, they're trying to sell songs, okay? They're trying mm -hmm. to make their money. And it's our job to be strong in who we are. Yeah. So that we really are an asset to ourselves and that we steer our lives where we want them to go instead of mm. being taken on a ride by other people who have a stronger vision. You better know your ass. You better know your ass. <laughs> yeah, you gotta know your damn ass. I'm really grateful that I went through all of that. And me too. And I'm grateful for the lessons. It's, it's taught me who I am. And a lot of times we find out who we are by learning who we're not. <laughs> Hell yeah. Amen to that. By trying things on and going, okay, no, that's that's not it. Um, that's not it. That's not her. But I can absolutely relate to what you're saying. I, I had no sense of self, and it was really mm. a, a living hell at the time. Yeah. Which is why we needed these pamphlets, because everyone could tell we had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> what, they're like, here's what you do. This is how you be a person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So thank you. To everyone from my past journey who has helped me get to where I am, whether it was through fucking me over or helping me, it's all been positive. Mm. I'm really proud of us. Me too. You said something about, we were talking about girls that got famous by being on Disney at a really young age. Yeah. Like Miley Cyrus and Hilary Duff and Vanessa Hudgens and all these girls. And you said... They're really special girls. It takes a very mm -hmm. special kind yeah. of person to go through that and to come out the other side. And I've been thinking about that a lot and taking it a step further and applying it to you and I. 
very okay. special, special girls that can go through something like that yeah. and come out and go on to have beautiful music careers and, and careers in the arts and, and, and talk about it and learn from it and learn from it. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very sweet thing to say. And I agree with you. I've never really thought about it, about it like that, but I agree. I think it takes some, we've got some grit, Lucy. Watt. <laughs> definitely have some sandy ass grit. <laughs> You sandy ass, dusty ass bitch. <laughs> That's something that I do all the time, and I don't know. It literally Gosh, when I get crazy. mad with somebody, she's like, crazy. Oh, read, like everyone laughs at me because I'm like sandy ass, dusty ass. <laughs> Just mumbling under your breath. <laughs> That's definitely an English thing. Oh well, God bless America. That's what my dad used to say every time he did anything. <laughs> he would end everything with, God bless America. <laughs> he was trying to keep that green card, you know. God bless America. God save the queen. Hell yeah. I love you. Love you. The Lucy and Annabelle Show is brought to you by me, Annabelle Jones. And me, Lucy Walsh. Theme tune by Lucy Walsh. You are produced by Paul Kaminsky. Find us on Instagram at The Lucy and Annabelle Show. Love you. You wanna help me? You wanna do me dirty? You wanna mess with me? You better work, bitch. You wanna run the guinea? Sit in martinis, look hot in a bikini. You better work, bitch. You wanna live fancy, live in a big mansion. Party in France. You better work, bitch. You better work, bitch. You better work, bitch. You better work, bitch. Now get your work, bitch.